Do you know your ABCs? Well, I do, and today we're going to use that knowledge to help out a friend. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Cloud42. I'm James. Well, I recently got an email message from friend and fellow YouTuber Harold Waters over at Amateur Redneck Workshop. He is building a pantograph machine and wanted to know how hard it would be to design a 3D printable set of letter and number templates for it. I told him I didn't think it would be too hard, but the more I think about it, the more I realized there are some challenges and that might actually make an interesting video. He agreed and he told me that he thought the easiest way to do this would be for me to take some gear that I already have here in the shop and repurpose it so that I could remotely control his brain and he could do the modeling himself. That way we could avoid sending files back and forth. Well, here we are in Redneck Workshop getting ready to crack open a new jug of moonshine. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're gonna, gonna do today, moonshine. Oh, something's, something's wrong struggle my head. I ain't even drank none yet. What? Oh, oh my gosh, 360, make scares. Ah, ah. It did not go well. So why don't we go into the computer and I will walk through the modeling while Harold recovers from whatever that was. We're going to do the modeling here in Fusion 360 and as usual I'm going to start with setting up some parameters. And I've already entered a number of things here. I'm going to be creating little plastic blocks with letters engraved into them for a stylus to follow. And so here are the dimensions I'm going to start with. I'd like the text to be an inch high. Um, you know, 20, I could put this in as 25 millimeters. One inch appears to be kind of the standard for pantograph machines. It's always possible to come in and change this later. I'm just going to work with an inch. And then I've got another parameter in here to define the overall height of the blocks. I'm going to make those one and three quarters because I want a little bit of extra space on the top and bottom because I'm going to have some width to the groove that the stylus needs to follow. And speaking of the stylus, I'm going to define the stylus diameter as one eighth of an inch. Again, that's an easy size to make. There's lots of stock available where I live and I know where Harold lives that is that size by default. And then I want to put in some compensation parameters here. I don't want to make the groove exactly the same width as the stylus. I want it to be a little bit wider so there's a little bit of space around it. We'll add 10 thou for that. And I don't want the depth to be exactly the same as the stylus radius. The, the idea is it will grind or turn a spherical end on the stylus. And I'd like that to fit down in the groove plus a little bit more. So there, there will be a little bit of square wall at the top. We'll call that 20 thou. And then we can calculate the groove width as the diameter plus the extra width and the groove depth, the stylus diameter divided by two, the radius, plus the extra depth. And then I've got a couple of other parameters in here that we'll talk about more when I use them. Overshoot and the fillet size. And you'll note that the fillet size is half the groove width minus a little bit, and we'll talk about why. And I just thought of one other parameter that I want in here, and that's the block thickness. And we'll start out with 150 thou. That'll probably be fine. Okay, if we're gonna make some letters, we're gonna need some letters. So let's create a sketch. We'll put this on the XY plane, create text, and we'll put in big old text block. And we need an alphabet in here. So I will just put in all 26 letters. And in fact, I'm gonna put a space at the beginning because I don't want this jammed right up against the zero coordinate. I'd like it spaced over a little bit. So we'll put a little bit of extra space in there. Now let's talk about fonts. Uh, we can go down here, we can pick any font that we want, but the way fonts work, these fonts are designed for print. And so they're designed with a specific aesthetic look. I've picked Broadway here just to illustrate my point. And you can see that the vertical strokes on this font are very, very wide. And the other strokes, like the horizontal strokes on the E here, are very, very narrow. So almost every font is this way to some degree. 
where you don't have consistent width of the strokes because it's not being it's not designed for a stylus to follow up mechanically it's designed to give a certain aesthetic look when it's printed and so instead of using a font i'm sure there are fonts out there that have lines that are all the same width that were designed for that i'm not super familiar with that instead i'm just going to model them so i will know that i'm getting exactly what i want so if we go up here to the top, you can see there are a bunch of fonts with this .shx extension. And these are single line fonts. So I'll just pick one, ISO. And these are single strokes. They have no width, they are just lines. And I'll make sure that I have this set to align middle so it's centered vertically in the box. Click OK. And now we have a sketch with our alphabet. Now I decided to just type all the letters in and let it space them out. You can see this is a variable width font. The I is narrower than the H, for example. And the font layout engine is taking care of the kerning, which is the space between the letters. Now in traditional typesetting, that spacing between the letters is going to be adjusted based on which letters they are. Like you can see that the space between the S and the T here looks wider than the space between the M and the N. Now in reality, vertically between the S and the T really is the same as the space between the M and the N, but because of the weight and the location of the lines and the open space on the side of the T, it looks different. Now, if we were gonna to try to compensate for that, we would use a font with proper kerning or a layout engine with proper kerning, but we would have to lay out the letters for the particular words that we want to engrave. In this case, we're gonna mix and match the letters. So the best we can do is try to just even up the space between them and create these tiles because the tiles are gonna be rearranged depending on what you're actually trying to engrave. So we will just go ahead and let it lay out, you know, like the I is narrower than the H, let it lay them out that way, and we'll cut them apart into blocks and call it a day. And if you really want something better than that, you're really looking at CNC graving, engraving or making a specific template with just the text that you're trying to engrave. So I'll go ahead and finish that. Actually, let's edit the sketch and look at this text box and dimension it. So D for dimension. We do want the height of this to be the block height. And the only reason that matters is because we set the font to be centered in that height and we want it to be centered there. Now, the last thing that we need to do in here is we need to explode this text. These are not really lines or paths or vectors. This is still a font object. So I will right click on it, say explode text, and now it has gotten rid of the text object and replaced it with a bunch of lines. Okay, now that we've got the text, I'm gonna create a separate sketch to sketch the blocks. So I will say create sketch, and we'll put it on this same plane, and we're gonna locate it in the same physical space, but I wanna have the lines for the blocks in a different sketch from the lines for the letters. And the reason for that is that you can see some of these letters are enclosed and they define an enclosed area. And I don't want that to interfere with extruding the blocks. So I will create a two point rectangle. I will put it all the way around my alphabet, make sure I've got plenty of extra space there. Hit D for dimension and I will dimension this same thing to the block height. Now we need to divide the letters up and I'm just gonna do this with a bunch of lines. Hit L for line, come up here, pull it down and you can see that it automatically adds the perpendicular constraint, which is what we want. Incidentally, if you leave this in the same sketch with the text and you leave the text box around it, these lines will try to stick to the text box rather than the uh, rectangle that we drew here, and you won't get those perpendicular constraints. So if you're having trouble doing that, that's probably why. And I will go ahead and just divide up the rest of these letters. Okay, now that all those lines are in, I am just gonna come back and adjust them and try to make sure that visually they're centered. And then for the end, I'm gonna to try to make sure that the letter is visually centered in the block. And this is not a precise thing. You know, a little bit of error here is gonna to lead to a little bit of error in the kerning of the font when you actually go to engrave with the blocks. 
but it's all a compromise anyway because we don't have a proper typesetting engine with proper kerning. So I'll just, I'll just adjust these by eye. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. I'll just finish the sketch. And now let's go back and extrude the blocks. So E for extrude, and what I'm gonna do is I am going to just hold control and I'm gonna click every other block. Because if I tried to extrude them all at the same time, they'll end up all connected together. So I'll say minus block thickness, and that will create a bunch of blocks. Now I'm gonna turn that sketch back on because it gets turned off automatically. And I'm gonna go through and I'm going to select all of the other blocks in between. And I'll hit E to extrude again. And we'll do the same minus block thickness. And instead of join, which is the default, which will result in a single body, I will instead say new body. So all of these will be created as separate new bodies. So if we look over here in the tree, we have a body now for every single one of the letters. And I can turn off that sketch now, it's no longer needed. And I am gonna go through and I'm gonna rename the bodies because the body names are ultimately gonna be used in the file names when we export these. And that is that. Does it bother you that these are in the wrong order? It bothers me that they're in the wrong order, but I don't know of a good way to fix it. And in the end, these are gonna be exported as files and the file system can automatically sort them into the correct order at that point. And until then, it doesn't really matter. Okay, now that we've got the blocks, let's extrude the letters into them. And to do this, we're gonna use the thin extrude feature. So I'll hit E for extrude and you have the type up here. We will choose thin extrude and this is for extruding around lines. So if I just click on a line here, we can see what it's doing. Distance, I want this to be minus the groove depth. And I want the wall thickness to be the groove width. And you can see it's doing this on the inside of the line. I want it centered, so we'll change that to center. And this will just extrude a groove of the correct width and depth around those lines. Now I will just go through and select all of the rest of the lines we want to extrude. And here we run into our first problem on the letter B. I click this and you can see it's not extruding it. If I instead come in here and turn off chaining, and so I can select just one segment at a time, you can see we're having a little bit more success. Now this does seem to be order dependent. I've had situations where if I don't click these things in the right order, it doesn't work. Like you can see there, down here at the bottom of the B, we're not getting what we want. If I just unclick one of these and re-click it, it seems to work. And so Fusion has some, call them bugs, call them personality features. I'll turn the chaining back on and use that for most of the letters because it's working. But whenever that doesn't work, I gotta go back, turn off chaining and select individual lines. And click OK. And now we have some basic grooves. Now there are some problems here and we can sort of begin to see them when we look at this. If we compare the A and the B here, you'll note that the groove for the B comes down quite a bit further than the groove for the A. And if I turn this sketch back on, you can see why. The, the stylus, we want to have it actually follow this line. So this line is the center line that the stylus should follow. But you can see here with the A, a round stylus is gonna make it down to about here, and the edge of the stylus is gonna hit the end of that groove, and it's not actually gonna make it to the end. So if we want it to make it to the end, we have to extend the groove further. So I will go ahead and just click that, and right click and say, uh, press pull and we will press this out some amount and we want that distance to be the uh, groove width 
uh, actually I did put in a parameter for this. This is the overshoot and that's what we talked about. So this is basically half the groove width. And though I wanted to extend it, so we'll say minus overshoot. Okay, so you can see now that's extended down and that makes a lot more sense where the edge of the stylus will reach the end here and the center of the stylus will reach the end of the line. So I'll just hit control and go through and just sort of look at all the places here where that's gonna be an issue. And you can see D doesn't have any, E has three of these ending points, but any place where there's a blunt end that we need to extend it, I'll just go through and click all of those or control click all of those and we'll just fix these all up. Okay, and I think that is all of them. Just doing a quick check here to make sure I've extended them all. And click OK. So that gives us our groove width. And so you can definitely see it here, down here on the F. Prior to this, you can see the F doesn't go down as far as the bottom of the E, and now it does, so the stylus will reach the same height. Okay, that looks good. Now I would like to round over the edges of these Will this work the way it is? Yeah, technically it will. The stylus will come up here and it'll collide with this far wall, but I really would like to round off the top of that. So I will hit F for fillet and we will just come in here and I defined a parameter for the fillet size and we will just come through and hit all of these outside corners. Now, little tip, I'm holding control to select these. You can select these lines even when they're not visible through the model and so that makes this process a lot easier in terms of you know wrenching your viewport around trying to see and be able to click on all of these like the top of the e here i don't have to change my angle of view to see that i can just click right through the model Now note, these are only the inside corners on the outsides of the letters. Places here on the interior where there's an outside corner, I don't want to round that off because I want the stylus to be forced all the way out here. It's not perfect, but I definitely don't want to round that off. So let me just do the rest of these. Okay, did we get everything? Looks like. Okay, could we stop here? Yes, we absolutely could. And you could use a cylindrical stylus and you would probably have no problem. But are we gonna stop here? Oh, come on, I got a reputation to uphold. Uh, I would like to add another feature here. I would like to make the bottom of this curved so that the stylus will follow the center line. Like here in the B, you can see it would be possible for the stylus when it gets into this region, it's not really clear where it should go. And in fact, in a lot of these intersections, it would be possible for the stylus to take a path outside of the stroke of the letter. So I would like to curve the bottoms of these letters to make sure that that doesn't happen. So let me turn off this sketch so we're just looking at the letters. And I'm gonna use the fillet tool and I want to fillet the bottoms of these. Now, let me save first because I want to demonstrate something for you. Let's go back here in the parameters and you'll see that the fillet size, I put the groove width divided by two, which makes sense. We want a round bottom in here, but I subtracted a 10,000th of an inch. Let's look at what happens if I don't do that. So this is another case where Fusion has some personality that gets in the way. So if I hit F for fillet, I can either select the line that I want to fill it or I can select a surface. There used to be a feature uh, a long time ago called a rule fillet, but they've apparently been combined now. So I can just click the bottom of this letter and I can just say, uh, make this the fillet size. Enter, and you can see Fusion has gone away. It is frozen and it will never come back. It will hang here for a while and eventually it's going to pop up a dialogue and ask if I would like to submit an error report because we have just crashed it. And all we did was try to create a fillet in the bottom of this complex shape where the two would come together and meet in the center. 
So let me kill this, restart it, reload, and let's try adding a little bit of extra space. Okay, I've got this reloaded from the point where we saved, and if we go back and look at the parameters, you can see what I've done here is instead of the fillet size being half of the groove width, is half of the groove width minus a very small amount. So the fillets will not actually meet in the bottom. And if we do exactly the same thing again, say F for fillet, select this and put in the fillet size, you can see now instead of crashing, it has actually put in the fillet. And uh, I'm not going to demonstrate it, but if I go back in here in the modify and change that parameter by taking off that ten thousandths of an inch gap that you see shimmering here in the bottom, it will immediately crash again. So I'm just going to hit control and we're just going to continue going through and filleting the bottom of all of these letters. And I'm just doing a few at a time, hitting control, clicking them and then letting go to see if it's handling it correctly. And it is. This way, if I run into one where there's a problem with complex geometry, I'll be able to see what letter it was and we won't just be, you know, it won't just nope and go away. Now this is the point where I say, wow, it looks like this is gonna be successful, but I won't say that until we're actually done because I'm not an idiot. Okay, that worked. I have seen cases with certain fonts and certain geometries where that does not work, but that does here. And so what that's done is it's created a round surface in here that the stylus, if we grind a ball end on the stylus, can be manipulated to follow this groove and it won't be tempted to come across here. Could you force it across? Absolutely. But you have the option of holding it down in the groove and getting it to follow around cleanly so that you can then engrave, using the pantograph, that single stroke font that we started with. Now I was just looking at pantograph equipment available out on eBay and noticed that a lot of the fonts that are available have dovetails on the ends of them so that they can fit into a dovetail groove to line up the text. And this is a listing for some screw end stops that are used to fix the text into position. And thought, well that's easy, we can do that. Let's go ahead and put dovetails onto these. And what I'll do is I will just pull this up so we're looking at the end of the type. Right click, say create sketch, P for project, and I'll just project this entire end surface into the sketch so I have some lines to work with. Now Fusion kind of does this by default, but I have that feature turned off so that I can project only when I want to. So hit L for line, and we'll just draw a couple of angled lines here, and D for dimension, and we'll come back and put in the angle we want. And I want 60 degree dovetails, because I have 60 degree dovetail cutters in my shop. Finish sketch, grab those two profiles, E for extrude, push it that direction and say distance all. And that's it. We've now cut dovetails on the ends of all the letters. Now I don't want to go through and export these individually or 3D print them individually. So what I'll do is I'll just right click on the top level model. Remember we have a separate body for each of these. I'll right click on the model and say save as mesh. And that gives us a dialog over here to decide how we want to save it. We're going to save it as STL and unit type. This document unit type is inches because that's how I designed the letters. But uh, instead, I want to output these as millimeter because pretty much every tool, every slicer that you just grab an STL and drop it into, it's going to see it as millimeters. So I'll make the file in millimeters since STL has no unit information embedded in the file. It just has to guess. Most tools are going to guess millimeters, so that's what I'll set it to. And structure, instead of one file, I will say one file per body. And click OK, and it'll want to know where to save it. We'll call this the pantograph alphabet. I'll take off the V4. Save, and it should export these as individual files. And as promised, here they are, and they are sorted back in order. So if that was really bothering you, uh, these are now in order, so here we go, A, B, C, D, E, and I can click through these. You can see the previews. It has saved these out as individual STL files, one per letter.
Now that we have all of our letters designed and exported as STL, we just need to print them. So I'll bring up my slicer. In this case, I'm using Simplify 3D, but uh, most slicers work the same way. I can just take all of my files, drag them in, and it will lay them all out on the bed ready to print. Now, I'm using an 8-inch printer definition because I know Harold is using an Ender 3, which is a little over 200, it's like 220 millimeter square bed. So this would be suitable for, suitable layout for printing on his printer. Now, he asked me if there was a way to not have to deal with all the individual files. And yes, most slicers have this functionality. I will just hit Control A to select all of the models. And I will say File, Export Models as a Binary STL. Give it a name. And it will export a file that contains the entire alphabet laid out. And so now if I'm in my slicer and uh, let me just delete all of these, I should be able to take that entire alphabet STL, drag that in, and now we just have one model that is the entire alphabet and we can drop that anywhere we want. Now in reality, you would probably want to have duplicates of letters like E that are used multiple times. But in this case, I've just got a layout here with one of each letter and these are ready to print. And that's really all there is to it. I'll get these files packaged up and sent over to Harold. If you're interested in using these letters for your own pantograph or for anything really, I have uploaded the files to both Thingiverse and Printables. There is a link down in the video description. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. What's the most complicated thing you've tried to model? What's the worst disaster you've created trying to model something? Is there any aspect of modeling in Fusion 360 that you find particularly difficult or confusing that I could use as a subject for a future video? Let me know. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.